This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. There's still a lot of misunderstandings about what medical aid in dying is, and there's still a lot of that stigma that it's like physician-assisted suicide. Because there's so much information, misinformation out there, you know, there's still some stigma attached to it for some folks. Um, you know, thinking that um, from others being like, oh, you, so you killed your loved one or you let them kill themselves, where it's, it's not, it's the disease that was killing them. You know, they just were able to make a choice whether they still wanted to be in pain anymore. This is the Heart of Hospice podcast with Helen Bauer. My guest today is Leilani Maxera, a social worker, grief worker, and death educator. Whether you're a family caregiver or an end-of-life professional, the Heart of Hospice is here to enhance your hospice experience by connecting you with information you can use about end-of-life care. I love this conversation today with my guest, Leilani Maxera. Leilani is a licensed clinical social worker. She works in Hawaii, and she is a therapist, a death educator, and a grief worker with her own private practice. I would tell you the name of it, but I can't even get close. It's a beautiful Hawaiian word with all this meaning. I can't even get close to saying it correctly. So you have to listen to the interview to hear her say the name of her business. She has experience in harm reduction, managing a syringe exchange and an overdose prevention program. But now she's working in private practice, and she does grief support groups. She does one-on-one counseling. She does advanced care planning counseling. She also is on the board of the National Home Funeral Alliance. And she does volunteer work doing capacity evaluations for made patients, medical aid in dying, there in Hawaii. So she's doing a lot of great work. She's got a really great personal story that was sort of the catalyst behind her doing work inside the death space. So here's my conversation with Leilani Maxera. Leilani, welcome to the Heart of Hospice podcast. It's so awesome to see you today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So we're going to jump in because I've already given your bio, but let's do an icebreaker question just to, so they can get to know you a little bit. Sure. I didn't send this question to Lalani, so we're putting her on the spot. Lalani, what is one small thing that most people don't know about you? Ooh, I don't, I don't know. I think I'm pretty vocal. <laughs> it's like people know most stuff. Are you you're um, an open book most of the time? Ah, uh, pretty much. I'm an open book. It's like someone's like, oh, it's. I think everybody knows. I talk about my favorite TV show, my favorite band, um, all that stuff. Um, oh, I one. I think one maybe one thing people don't see except my partner is I do a crossword puzzle every every night when I eat dinner. Oh. I, I love crossword puzzles. If I, uh, I, I, if I had, um, if I felt like paying for the New York Times crossword puzzle, I would do that one too. But oh I don't, man! I, that, on principle, I won't pay for it. That's a bear, though. I have yeah. tried to do that in the past. I don't do crossword puzzles. <laughs> I used to do them all the time when I read the the paper newspaper, but man, the New York Times, that's impressive. You let me know. I will be <laughs> in awe of you. I used to love doing it when I got the paper, like the physical paper, but I stopped getting it. So. Right. But yeah, I love, I love crossword puzzles. Nice. Nice. So yeah. you're, you're an intellectual. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you are also a social worker 
in addition to being a person who works the crossword puzzle. How did you come to be a social worker doing death work of all things? Well, actually, death work came first um, before becoming a social worker. So it just so happens as we're talking today, uh, two days from now, Monday, May 22nd, is the, the anniversary of my grandmother's death, my maternal grandmother. And uh, it'll, it'll be 17 years um, since she's been with us. And her death completely changed my life and pivoted what I was doing with my life. Um, you know, prior to that, other people in my family had died. It was not the first death I dealt with. But everyone else who had died in, in my family or friend circle, it was like a sudden death you know, su suicide, accident, et cetera. But my grandma had, um, she had dementia at the time and she also had uh, pancreatic cancer and she was very sick and suffered for, for a long time. And I know it's hard to believe the, you know, in 2023, but at the time um, I didn't own a computer. I didn't own a smartphone. I didn't really have access easy access to a lot of this information about hospice, palliative care, advanced care planning, et cetera, that is much easier to find um, these days with like with the internet um, at your fingertips. And so my family didn't really know a lot about these things. We were all really scrambled. Like I honestly, I had a nervous breakdown at the time, um, just not knowing what to do for my grandma. And so when she died, I became obsessed with, with spreading the word about hospice and advanced care planning, palliative care, you know, just anyone who would listen because it was not offered to her. You know, I look back and I get very angry that hospice was never mentioned. No one asked if she had advanced care directive. And uh, once I kind of learned about all these things, more, of, more so after she died, did I have the chance and the time to research because when you're a, a caregiver, you don't really have time for much else. I had to keep my job because I needed my health care. So my life was just work, going to work and going to my grandma's house. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where my death, my death work journey began was, was education was kind of informally being like telling everyone, everyone who'd listen um, about these things. And uh, I ended up doing the prerequisites for nursing school because I was like, I, I want to, you know, take care of people who are dying, did all the prerequisites and then realized I'd be, t I'd be a terrible nurse. Why? <laughs> like, Why would you be a terrible I, nurse? I have no attention span. <laughs> I have a very short attention span and I got really, really paranoid that I would like to be, you know, forget I gave someone their medication or something would happen. And I just got really nervous about direct physical care. So after, you know, a couple of years of working and doing <laughs> nursing for Rex part time, because I was really trying to find my place, right? I knew I wanted to do death work. I knew I wanted to help people um, die better, do education. I just didn't know where where I fit in. So I was working in harm reduction at the time, um, syringe exchange and overdose prevention. And long story short, a friend of mine was applying to get their uh, master's of public health. And I thought that's where maybe I can make, that's where I can make a difference. So I ended up getting a master's of public health um, with emphasis in aging and ended up after that working for in, in California as the manager for the uh, post, you know, physician's order for life sustaining treatment. So it was, you know, it's so exciting to be able to like have a paid job, like spreading the word about advanced care planning <laughs> and like, you know, educating people and helping people like understand that their choices at the end of life. Um, but I ended up uh, moving to Hawaii, where um, I'm native Hawaiian, and I, my dream had always been to come come home to where my mother came from, and so you know left that job. But you know, always always worked either worked or volunteered doing death work or and end of life care stuff and harm reduction. They're my two biggest loves. So um, without being able to find a job. Up in the in, in end of life care when I got here, I ended up running the statewide syringe exchange and overdose prevention programs um, for all the islands for six and a half, almost seven years. And in that time, I kept trying really hard. Like I loved my work, but I really was like, how do I work directly with people having hard conversations, you know, being, being there for them where a master's of public health just wasn't doing that for me. So I went back to school 
uh, full time while I was working full time to oh, get a wow. master's of social work. And I was like, a social work degree will will get me uh, the clinical license that I need to basically build my own career. And so, you know, at some point I, I decided it was time to strike out on my own, got my license, you know, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I started my own business, um, Kaipo'o Ka'uoloku, which is um, individual therapy, consulting, and death work. So my main focus is is, is individual therapy, working directly with folks, but, um, you know, I, I do support groups, grief groups, individual advanced care planning, I do advanced care planning workshops, Um you know, I kind of was able to create my own thing so that I can work directly with people, do as much death care and education as possible, and you know, be, you know, help where I can. But I'll I'll be honest, most of my death work is unpaid and volunteer. <laughs> most it's most of my paid work is therapy. So I think a lot of uh, a lot of end of life workers would yeah. say the same that a yeah. lot of the stuff they do is unpaid. A lot of the counseling and support that they provide. So one of the things that you also provide is you do grief support groups for families of people who have utilized MAID, medical aid and dying. Yes. So let's talk about that a bit. It's a growing movement across the United mm-hmm. States. Um, we're adding more and more states every year, but of course it's not legal everywhere. It's not legal here in Texas where I practice. Mm-hmm. But you have these support groups because this is a special group of people when it comes to grief needs. What what do you see as far as what they need in a grief support group that's different from everybody else? Um, yeah, no, great question. So I, I, I right now actually do two different medical aid and dying uh, bereavement support groups for loved ones. The one that we started here just for folks in Hawaii, it's been a little over a year now that it's been going and how it got started was me and my colleague, uh, Joy Rodriguez, who's an end of life doula here had, um, just kind of heard from other practitioners that there was a need for more made specific grief support. And we're like, cool, let's, let's be the people that do that and get it started. Then like we, we heard there was a need and tried to fill it. Right. So we, we volunteered starting this group. Um, it's once a month and, what we found talking with folks is is well several things one is that you're 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 correct in that it is not that widespread there's many many states that don't have it yet and because it's not there's still a lot of misunderstandings about what medical aid and dying is and there's still a lot of that stigma that it's like physician assisted suicide right dr kevorkian yeah and because there's so much information, misinformation out there, you know, there's still some stigma attached to it for some folks, um, you know, thinking that um, from others being like, oh, you, so you killed your loved one or you let them kill themselves where it's, it's not, it's the disease that was killing them. You know, they just were able to make a choice whether they still wanted to be in pain anymore, right. but the disease itself is what was killing, was killing them, the people who made this choice. And so, you know, yes, hosp- you know, hospices have support groups. There's other support groups out there for bereaved loved ones that folks can go to. But this is a space where they could talk very freely about the choice that their loved one made without feeling um, like they will be judged and and talk with other people who have understanding of their their very specific situation. They can they don't have to explain themselves, you know. And then another thing that that has come up, you know, is is even guilt. You know, it's a different kind of guilt knowing knowing the time of somebody's death, knowing when it's going to happen, and that should I have stopped it? Is this is what this is what they wanted? But feeling like I I wanted my person still to be here, right? right? right. So kind of that juggling of emotions of like knowing that that person made a choice with what they wanted to do with their death, but you know, um, what could have been done differently? Is am I at fault in some way for, for being of supportive of this? Would they still be here if I wasn't supportive? So like a lot of, of different complicated emotions come up that are very specific to, to folks who've gone through the made process. And so, um, like I said, we just wanted to create that space where people could speak freely with each other and and understand what what, sh- what each other went through. We had an, uh, an anthropologist on the show, Anita Hanig, who wrote a book about medical aid and dying and the work that's being done here across the United States. And she said that 
some of the family members that she talked with didn't share the mechanism of how their person died, their loved one, even with friends, or, um, especially not with coworkers in more casual relationships, but even with friends, because they were scared of the judgment and the comments and the lack of support that they were going to yeah. get. That must be incredibly isolating for these yeah. family members. Yeah, I've I've seen kind of both extremes of that um, in terms of Joy and I just hosted a panel with some of the members of our Hawaii bereavement group because we also started one nationally as well over over Zoom. Um, But the Hawaii specific one, we had folks um, who, who, you know, in, in talking, they really wanted to tell their stories. They wanted to share their stories as far and wide as possible so that they could help educate others and know that they weren't alone and kind of answer to things like that. Like, you know, it's okay. There's other people out there. Let's, let's speak freely about this and, and maybe help squash that stigma as well. And so, you know, we just hosted a panel with five people telling their stories um, recently and it went very well, like a hundred and almost 140 people RSVP'd. Um, it, so, you know, the people are hungry to hear these personal stories because they're just, because of a stigma, a lot of people aren't out there telling their stories. And so we're, I'm very proud of the, those folks. And also at the same time, we do have people that come to our group that, you know, don't want to tell anyone publicly that, you know, even some friends and family don't know how their loved one died. And that's okay too, because that's where they're at, that they're in a different place where they're not getting that same support in their personal life that they're getting in this group. And there's no judgment on them for not sharing their stories because, you know, they're doing what they can to get through the situation without the love and support that they should be getting. You know, grief is hard enough as it is. Although it's a universal human experience, it's very, very individual, very unique to each griever. Even, you know, two daughters grieving the same parent, two siblings grieving the same sibling. So one of the things that you do in your volunteer work (laughs) that you don't get paid for is you do capacity (laughs) evaluations for MAID patients there in Hawaii. So it it MAID is legal in your state, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. but one of the the legal requirements is they have to have uh, an evaluation prior to or as part of the MAID process. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the work that you're doing there. Yeah, so... um so every state has different requirements and, you know, and, and also just say Hawaii is one of the more recently legal places for medical aid and dying just right, right before COVID actually, it, you know, it began 2019, um, it became legal here and which was unfortunate timing. Of course, everything was unfortunate timing with COVID, sure. you know, every, yeah, right. absolutely everything, but the, you know, the, the education wasn't, you know, as far and wide because other things took took precedent right so sometimes i still meet people you know here you know here a few years later that don't know that it's legal here so there's we're still trying to do that education um but it, it's one of the more recent states where it passed and it's one of the hardest um states to get made in terms of the the requirements because requirements in each state is different and ours is is a 20-day waiting period where it's shorter in other places between mm-hmm. and when i say 20-day waiting period it's before um there's a waiting period from your first request Quest for the medication in your second. Some people die waiting for that second request because it's so long and it's shorter in other states. Um, and then we have this added extra step of getting a capacity evaluation from a either a psychiatrist, psychologist, or licensed clinical social worker, where basically they have to meet with you and 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 make sure you understand what you're asking for. That like if you take this medication, this is what happens. Once you put ingest it and put it in your body, there's no turning back. You can't change your mind and spit it out. Like, do you do you understand what you're asking for? And and also just assess if the person is is depressed or anxious, which which is hard because truly people are dying. So they are depressed and anxious because they are dying, but also just looking at the bigger picture of, of what is making them make this particular choice. And so um, uh, the reason I volunteer doing these evaluations is because there's a shortage of therapists here in Hawaii. There is a shortage of all medical providers here, but especially neighbor islands. So I live on Oahu, which is, you know, where the Honolulu is our, our biggest city 
And we, we definitely have more of a medical infrastructure, more practitioners here than neighbor islands. So I was approached by someone when I you know started my private practice saying, a, a fellow therapist, they're like, hey, I, I do these evaluations, for, you know, I volunteer doing them. I'm tired. Can you, are we, I feel like you'd be interested in this, that this is something you could handle. Like, I'm, I'm not afraid to ask you to talk to people about death. So would you be interested? And I was like, once I found out that there, that this was a hardship for folks that, you know, they were waiting because they could not find a therapist to do their evaluation. It was like actually hindering their process. I was like, yes, I absolutely, I will do this. And since I started, I've done, I just did one, one this week. I think I've done over 30 at this point of, and, you know, your doctors just contact me. They're like, here's the info on this person. This is, you know, what I've di they're diagnosed with. This is where they're in the process. Can you talk to them? And so because I'm able to do telehealth and meet with folks over Zoom, I'm able to serve people on other islands who otherwise wouldn't be able to find somebody on island to do their evaluation. But this is not for people that are outside of your state, right? This is state specific for Hawaii. Yeah, it's well, the law, the law itself is specific for our state that even requires this evaluation, because I, I don't know that any other state does right now. I think there was at least one, but I don't know if they do anymore. So it not only is it just a requirement here, but yes, I can only do this uh, for I can only practice within my license, which is in the state of Hawaii. Got it. Got it. It's it's interesting work. Yeah, the waiting periods are problematic for patients that are getting close yeah. to the end of life and they want to utilize maids. So sometimes the red tape trips us up quite a bit. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just kind of it goes for hospice too, you know, that it's introduced too late um, for yeah. folks. People are afraid to talk about it. They want, they want to do everything they can before they you know, talk about hospice. Sometimes doctors that are are not prepared to just like let folks go and, you know, people enroll in hospice. I used to be a hospice volunteer and my, the first person ever assigned to me, the person was died before I could even meet them. They, they died within 24 hours of being enrolled in hospice. Right. So we're really introducing these things late in the game and, and not giving people the chance to get the services they truly, that would truly benefit them at the end of life. Absolutely true. It's uh, we're we're swimming upstream like on that one. It's it's something we fight against every day, work to correct. We just don't have those conversations. The advanced care planning conversations don't happen as early as they should, as far upstream as they should inside the healthcare system. Yeah. And I had a boss that used to say, everybody's job is nobody's job. Meaning if you have not assigned that particular task, it's not going to get done. Mm. And I think that's sort of what advanced care planning ends up being because really it is everybody's job. It's not just a nurse. It's not just a social worker. Mm -hmm. It's not just a chaplain. It's not just the physician. We all need to be teaching and reinforcing and continuing mm -hmm. to have, you know, more than one conversation. Consequently, nobody does it because they figure another, another discipline is taking care of it. So I, you know, we're not going to fix that problem in one podcast. I think that's a whole nother yeah. show, but so you have another, um, I guess, a passion project that you're involved in. You're on the board of the National Home Funeral Alliance. Yes. Oh, it is a passion project. Yes. yes. I love the doing NHFA. Doing amazing work. So let's talk about home funerals. And you guys have actually just released a new resource this week. Yes. Yes. Super proud. Yeah. So let's talk about your work there and what the National Home Funeral Alliance does. Yeah, I would love to. Well, first of all, I always say this on the board that um, when I'm doing talks for us and stuff, I might be the only person who's like this uh, obsessed with home funerals and a huge advocate for them who's never had a home funeral or been to one. Like I talk about them constantly educating people about it, and I've never been to one myself. Really? <laughs> so yeah, oh, I hope to someday. But once, you know, once I heard that they were an option, it just, it's kind of like what I was talking earlier. It's like once I learned about hospice, it's like I got to tell everybody about hospice. <laughs> right. 
right, you know, right. once I learned about advanced care plans, like I got to let everyone know. I would never even knew home funerals existed, never heard of them. And, and basically for folks out there, home funeral is just basically what it sounds like. It's a, you know, a vigil and funeral that you you can have in the community that, you know, it is is absolutely legal to take care of our own dead. Um, it's the laws different in every state. You got to look into your local laws because a few states have requirements that on some level you have to have a licensed funeral director involved, whether it be transport, paperwork, et cetera. But all the law, the law in every state's different. But in every state on some level, it is legal to take care of your own loved ones and take care of your own dead in your community. And so I when I found out that about that, I was like, no, what wait, wait, what? <laughs> How right, have I never right. heard of this? And I got so excited. So that was about um 10 years ago, I first heard about home funerals and I um, had gone through a uh, death doula and home funeral guide course with Jerry Grace Lyons uh, final passages in um, Sebastopol, California at the time. And I was just, I was just like, so just enamored with the idea of being able to uh, t- take care of your own dead and 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 make those choices and keep somebody's body you know lying in honor at home for a few days so people could could really sit with the idea of their death and be together and um yeah so I just I got really excited about spreading the word about home funerals <laughs> and so got involved with the home funeral uh National Home Funeral Alliance um on the periphery back then and then you know uh, COVID hit and you know, I I wasn't I'd never on the board of an organization before the first time and, and COVID hit and I was still working um you know in person full time because I ran a syringe exchange not like that can go away obviously during uh during COVID people still needed that and, but I was approached by then our then president to like oh we have a board opening would you like to join and I was ecstatic. Um, and, and I, my three year term is up in October, super, super sad to be leaving, but for anyone listening out there, we are looking for new board members. So if you are excited about home funerals, please, please, please contact us. We, we need some new folks on the board. And one of the, you know, we took a pause, a very public pause during COVID because, you know, we, we were looking at our materials and looking at the offerings that we had to the public. And, and also, I'm so sorry to back up the National Home Funeral Alliance is basically, you know, an educational home for home funerals. Like, like there's, um, we, we have a paid admin staff right now, but besides that, it's all volunteer board, all volunteers. And um, it's just to get the word out, educate, help people connect, um, connect with each other and, and with the home funeral guides, etc. And so just basically your hub, try, trying to be the hub of home funeral education. You know, we, we took a very public pause because in looking at all of our educational materials, well, like, we need to update this, we need to do this. And we just felt this like urgency, right? Well, ur- a lot of times urgency is false. You know, you know, you got to take a step back and look at the bigger picture instead of like grinding to like get stuff done. Because in taking a step back, we realized that a lot of the materials of uh, the org that were that were out in the world did not align with the current board's views of some things. Like, for example, at the time, there was a lot of stuff out there was kind of us versus them with like funeral directors, right. like like embalming, oh, fun- you know, <laughs> your your average your funeral home, they're they're you know out for money or like just lots of like there's a lot of negative language out there when truly there's a lot of funeral directors and funeral homes that have bra- embraced home funerals as another alternative to offer the people that they serve and and you know work together with folks you know to let them have a choice so and and, you know we don't want to be anti-embalming i mean yes embalming has a lot of negative um you know stuff it puts in you know can put into the environment when you bury a body and also that is a choice people deserve to make and there's there's reasons they make that choice right so we really wanted to update the language and kind of change the vibe of like inclusiveness but also inclusiveness around race ethnic you know race and ethnicity gender um body type you know we had some language in some of our educational materials that was like you know, not really conducive to talking about like larger bodies, but, you know, when you're handling them and moving them. And so, um, so we decided to take a pause to, you know, to take a step back and really reevaluate our work our, on our educational materials. 
And in doing so, we decided to come out with a free home funeral guidebook for the community that anybody who wanted to have a home funeral and knew nothing about it could pick up this resource and just do it and do it themselves and have what they needed. Because like I said, we the, our older materials, we really wanted to update and, and they all weren't all inclusive of like, you could just do it. You know, there's pieces here, pieces there, body care here, like law here, but it was just all all encompassing, all in one resource. And also it's by donation. You can put zero dollar donation, get it for free. We wanted to make sure if people didn't have money to access this information, that it was available for free. Now, there's courses out there people teach on home funerals that are like $500, $1,000, and they're still going to exist. And people who want to take a class will still take it. But for for those who don't, and the, for those who need this information, it's free. It's there. It was a labor of love for about a year. We worked on this, and it and it just came out. So, wow! I'm, I'm really proud that we we put that out there so that anybody who wants to can have a home funeral and have the information they need. And it's just available as a free download on the National Home Funeral Alliance website, isn't it? Yes, yes, it, yes. You, of course, donations welcome, but you put in zero for your donation, you're still going to get it. Yep, right, right. It's available to everybody. That is awesome. I'm, I'm intrigued by home funerals, and we've talked about them on the podcast. We have the, you know, your director to come and be a guest, but I've never participated in one myself. Yeah. But I will say this to our hospice folks, end of life workers that are listening to the podcast. It's really good for you to be educated about what is allowed and legal in your state. As a hospice nursing director, I remember getting a call from a woman whose son, adult son had died in the home and she wanted to keep him there and basically have a viewing. Mm hmm. A vigil, I guess, is what you would call it. And she was being told no by her case manager. Mm -hmm. So the case manager um, referred her to me, and I did not know that that was allowable. Mm. I did not know. And I felt very ill-equipped. I ended up having to call a funeral director that I knew in the area. And, of course, he was very anti-home funeral. Mm. Yeah. And not necessarily the most informed about what the about what the legally allowed um, procedures are. So mm, I, I think okay. it's really important for anybody who works in any aspect of end-of-life care to know what's allowed in their area and that home funerals are, a, I've read wonderful tributes. People are doing some fantastic work. It can be very personal and meaningful. And I just, I love the work that National Home Funeral Alliance is doing. To support oh, people so that much. want to do that. Because that's one of the things your organization does there is answer questions, isn't it? They're there to be yeah. a resource. Yeah. So we have, so if folks, so let's say, you know, someone's out there and they're like, I have no idea where to get started. We have, um, we have a directory that, um, you know, folks have paid to, to join. That's like, it, you can look up by, by your area, by your state like other death doulas, home funeral celebrants, like folks that you can contact locally. Um, we have a monthly chat once a month. Um, the last Monday of the month where anybody who's a member can join and to be a member, you literally just uh, get on our email. List. There's no dues or anything. You just, it's just, you just sign in up. Touch. You just sign up. Yeah. And where anybody can come and, and network, but also ask questions of other folks because we've unpaused officially with the release of this guidebook, we're starting up our webinar series again. So our, our uh, monthly webinar series we used to do, we have different speakers on other, different topics. Our, actually, our um, first one kicking off co the, our comeback with our webinar series is actually this coming Monday, and it's on um, infant and child death. So um, a variety of speakers, uh, I think either the next one or one after is going to be about uh, tr uh, transgender death care. Um, so really trying to get a variety of topics out there. So we're really excited to be on pause and excited to be a resource for folks. Um, oh, and also I just want to put kind of a shout out out there is, is like I said, the, the um, laws are different in every state and we're constantly trying to update 
the information on our website. And we're always asking folks, if you know the laws for your state, please help us out. Make sure that what we got, the information we got is correct. Because we have a couple of board members who that's kind of their project is making sure that all the laws that we know of are correct. But number one, they're changing. <laughs> like laws change, you don't even, we don't even hear about it. And two, sometimes that information is buried. Like even here, I had a hard time being like, how, if I wasn't using a funeral director, how could I file a death certificate if I was having a home funeral? And I went, I went directly to the vital records office and the person was acted like I had two heads when I asked that. They're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But like even going in person and talking to someone, I couldn't get that information, right? So, so we're constantly trying to do our research, but we could always use the help. So if you're in a state where if you look at our website and see, no, 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 you don't got, you don't got the right info for my state or something's missing, please let us know because it's, it's a late of love to be updating that. Well, I'm going to make sure I put a link to the website in the show notes so that folks will be able to go into the National Home Funeral Alliance website and see all the new stuff that you guys are are launching now that things are rolling again. Thank you. So let's let's uh, we're going to get really personal now with okay. this question. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you have a, a deer in the headlights. Like, <laughs> so when you think about your own funeral, your own death. What are the some of the components of your advanced care planning? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, first of all, I have I have an advanced directive, <laughs> of course. <laughs> like, well, I, when I, I shouldn't even say of course because I remember doing a doing a in service at a hospice once, and I asked everyone in the room. There's like 30 people. Do you how many of you how many of you have an advanced directive? And like barely anybody did. And I was like, oh, we got to practice what we preach, you know? Oh yeah, uh, and I can't say anything. I won't throw any stones okay. about that because mine okay. mine is not complete, but it's kind of okay. like the in the advanced care planning walk of shame. You know, who who wants to actually raise their hand and say, I totally believe this is worthy and everybody yeah. should have one, but I have not done mine. Yeah. No, it's it's understandable. There's it's just like a, we we tell people, you know, it's like do as I say, not as I do, I guess, right? So, but but I I want to practice what I preach. I have my advanced healthcare directive. I do think it's very important. So, um I update mine regularly. Um for folks out there, you you probably should know you don't have to there's no expiration date on your advanced directive but you should always be updating it if something in your life changes you move you get divorced you have uh you know a change of of health status you have a change of heart about who you want to be your decision maker for whatever reason so sometimes you know i i uh, broke up with an ex and surely i updated my advanced directive to take them off as one of my decision makers right Or, or your decision maker decides they don't want to do it anymore yes Yes. And I also, you know, more depressing, I I had a conversation with someone recently like, oh, I got to update my advanced directive. Um, Both my decision makers have died recently, you know, so even that if something happened to them, you know, there'd be nobody to call. Right. So just always taking a look at what you got in writing and updating it when can. But um yeah, so I, I have my advanced directive going back to that and uh, very, feel very strongly about my decisions and my decision makers, uh, my two best friends, uh, I've chosen very specifically, one is a nurse, and so she she knows all the medical stuff, ins and outs, and my other decision maker is a uh, my best friend since high school is a hard ass. And so uh, if, if any of my family came along trying to question any decisions, she would be like, nope. So very, very purposeful decision on that one, which I always tell folks, if you have a difficult family or you have family members you're estranged from that might try to come in at the last minute and muck up decision making, if something happened to you, make sure you have definitely 100% make sure you have your advanced directive with somebody named who is going to be able to speak for you. Absolutely. That advocate, you say hard ass. And what I hear is sheep dog. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> you you need that sheep dog that's going to say, yeah, this is what she wanted. We're not going to do it any other way. Yep. Yeah, somebody yep. who's not going to compromise on the values that you set out. I yeah, like that. exactly, exactly. And we've had, and you know, 
I always say the most important part of, of picking your decision maker is actually having the conversation with them. Because if you pick somebody and you don't tell them, number one, that is not a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> that is not really good not cool. Scene. When you, you know, when you die and they're like, what? And they get a phone call, they're confused. What's going on? But also that they that they know exactly what you want and are willing to carry it out. Because you're right, some people might not be willing to you know, carry out decisions you would like. So I've been very, very specific with the two people who are my decision makers, very upfront, exactly what I want. We've had many conversations. They probably are sick of having <laughs> death conversations with me, honestly. <laughs> That's the problem. That's the problem with being a, a, a medical power of attorney or a decision yeah. maker for somebody yeah. who works in death care. You're going to yeah. have so <laughs> many conversations till you're like, okay, just go ahead and die already now because yeah. I'm so tired of talking about it with you. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're they're definitely not not as excited about me to have these conversations. But I, I think it's important. They know I think it's important, and they love me enough to to listen. I guess. Um, but but to go back, like I have my advanced care directive in place. It's in my medical record as it should be, so it's easily accessible by my medical providers. I got a copy, easy to find at home. So got that all squared away. But in general, um, also little things. I have a playlist for my funeral already oh. made out I love music I'm a music is very important to me so a long time ago I used to you know sought, it's defunct now because you know I'm old enough that it was it was a CD exchange and it's like who no. burns CD now? oh man um, I used to do a CD exchange back in the day and I'd pick a different theme every year. That's that's like chiseling in a stone tablet or something. <laughs> For folks now, again, like younger people, I guess it is, yeah. And I, I'd pick a different theme every year of like, that I'd give to people and like make a mix CD based on this theme. And one year I, it was uh, it was a funeral playlist and I got the idea back then and I thought it was a fun exercise, but then I, I take it very seriously. I've up now, of course, I don't burn CDs. I have a I have a playlist on my computer that it makes it easier to update to. And I have updated it every once in a while where a song I hear and I'm like, oh, that's that's the one. Gotta gotta keep that one. But yeah, it's all music I would like played if I had a a home funeral or vigil or memorial where folks will come together. I guess I really had to make my own too because nobody I know likes the same music as me. <laughs> also, so if I didn't make it, nobody else would. <laughs> Your advanced care planning is all about you. So do you so. want a home funeral? <laughs> I would I would love to have one if possible. I, I I definitely would, you know, of course it depends on the circumstances. I don't most I think a hard thing for me is while, you know, I've lived in Hawaii for nine years. And I've, I've made some community here. My my closest loved ones are still on the continent um, and in California. So I think that's they're the people who would most likely be the ones that would help me carry out a home funeral and want that are not here. And the logistics of flying across the ocean, um, getting here in time, it, it would make it more difficult. So yeah. pr uh, previously, a friend of mine who was a home who was a former board member of the home funeral national home funeral alliance lived here and when and, and she has since moved but when she lived here i was like okay you live here and so you're gonna plan my home funeral if i die they're like yes 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 and then they moved so i've that is a plan i have to kind of reconsider because um the current apartment i live in is very small and you can have a home funeral in a small space and you can also have it not in a home right you can uh you have it in a church or you could have it in a veterans hall or, you know, community space. Like you could have a community based funeral, not just in the home, but, you know, I think about my resources and what I have access to my, my apartment is probably the most likely scenario. And I don't, um, and I have to think of considerations. Like I don't have air conditioning. Uh, it's really hot right now. Like I'm sweating to death and it's like 1030 in the morning. <laughs> That's yeah. it. There, it's there are a lot of logistics else. to think over yeah. when it comes to, to doing a home funeral in a personal space, I guess. Yeah. So for yeah. me, a home funeral might not be possible with the planning that I have currently not being too good and like the community that I have here not being as close as my loved ones, you know, back in California. So um, the answer is a maybe on that. Um, definitely would like to be cremated. I know that much. Have already talked with my partner about that. 
Um, but I think that I should, you know, in terms of the, that part, I, I probably just in saying all that out loud need to be planning a little better. I had a whole plan. That plan has changed since the person who I planned it with moved away. <laughs> right, right. So it's time to update again. Yeah. 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 So, but I, yeah, I would have, lo- I would have loved to have one and would still love to have one if it, if it seems possible, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like every other aspect's pretty planned out though. My, even my, uh, the people I've named as my decision makers even know who I don't want to visit me in the hospital <laughs> if something happens. Like I've even planned that out. So that's your sheepdog. That's your yeah. advocate. I love it. I love it that you've put so much thought into this. I think it's important. It really is. So how can my listeners connect with you? I, I'm not even going to attempt in my southern drawl to say the name of your business. That's okay. That's okay. So um so my website uh, you well, I, I bought a few domain names pointing to the same one. So my business is Kaipo o Kauoloku, and that's my website. But also, if you just go to Leilani Maxera.com, if that's easier for you, it will point you know, it all points to the same website. My email address is Leilani.maxera.therapy at gmail.com. And that's the best way to get hold of me. I would give my phone number out, but I don't answer my phone. So that's not a great way <laughs> to find me. So email's best. I think your email and your <laughs> website will be fine. I'll have all of it in the show notes. So everybody will be able to access it easily. And Leilani, thank you so much for talking with me today. You're a breath of fresh air. And I just love the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that you uh, wanted to talk with me today. It was fun. Thank you. Okay, I have to say, she wanted to be a nurse, okay? She wanted to be a nurse first, all right? Nurses are awesome. But she became uh, a social worker, and now she works in private practice. I love the work that she's doing to support family members of people who have utilized medical aid in dying. So important. Their bereavement needs are different. Their grief is special. It has unique aspects. And it's great that she and Joy Rodriguez are working to support that group of people. The capacity evaluations, man, the shortage of healthcare providers, it's hitting Hawaii just like it is everywhere else. We're experiencing it here in the state of Texas as well. And her passion for home funerals, she's so cute. She's never been to one, but she is definitely working to support home funerals, education, legislation. So I want to tell you that if you are interested in getting the guidebook that she mentioned that just came out, you can go to homefuneralalliance.org and look for their home funeral guidebook. Okay, it's available for free. Or if you feel led to donate, you can make a donation uh, to purchase, quote unquote, purchase the guidebook as well. So I would encourage you to connect with Leilani and the work that she's doing. I'll have links in the show notes to everything and you'll be able to see what she's doing. Some great work. Be sure to catch the next episode of the Heart of Hospice podcast. You can find more episodes on theheartofhospice.com. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You can connect with the Heart of Hospice on Facebook and Instagram and send me your questions or comments by email to helen at theheartofhospice.com. And remember, no matter who you are or where you are in your hospice journey, you are the heart of hospice. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.